D, you ready? Yeah, I'm good. Hello? Hey, Auntie. Hey. Son, how you doing? How you, doing? you at work? No, I'm I'm just at the house. Oh, at at your house in Oakland? Yeah. So Delancey's mm-hmm. on the other line too. You met Delancey at Kwanzaa a few years ago. So oh yes, yeah. Sir, we, uh, uh-huh. we how you doing? We interviewed today? his great grandma. Hello. <laughs> nice to talk oh, to you. Oh good. Yeah, you guys too. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm excited to get some of the the family history now and to hear okay. more about your story. My story. You want family history? Uh, where do you want me to start? Um, I'll, I'll start uh, with the first question. I'll get. I'll, I'll help you out. Okay. You, <laughs> yeah. Ask me a question. Then maybe I can relate. This is Tales of the Town, a podcast about Black Oakland. I'm Delancey Parham, and I'm Abbas Montakim. We're two organizers who are building for revolutionary change in Oakland. We both got deep roots in this city and its rich history of radical activism. We got aunts and uncles who are Black Panthers and a community of people who are doing the work today. All of them fighting for Black liberation, all of them shaped by Oakland. And me and Delincey, we've been organizing together for years on college campuses and in the streets of Oakland. Through our organization, People's Programs, we've been providing resources for those who are going through houselessness and building community educational programs and a whole bunch of other programs too. So this work in this town, It's who we are. So if you value community, family, black culture, and history, we know you're going to like this show. We're excited to shed light on stories and people you may have never heard of, and to also provide a more intimate look at events and moments you may have only witnessed on the news. And maybe you know nothing at all about Oakland. But by the end of this season, we hope you'll have the same love and appreciation of Oakland that we do. And maybe it will encourage you to dive deeper into the history and the culture of the city that you live in. Oakland is this window into things that are probably happening in your backyard. Protests over police, the pandemic, issues around housing and gentrification. And a lot of times, these things that become national issues, they were popping off here in Oakland months or even years before the rest of the country knew about them. And Oakland's black community is usually ahead of the curve, too. We is literally in the birthplace of the Black Panther Party. The man doesn't have us out, nobody has us out organized. Come on now. I have absolutely no power as an individual. The power is with the people. So the real question is, what are the people going to do? We don't hate nobody because of their color. We hate oppression. We hate murder of black people in our communities. So no matter where you live, if you care about justice, about radical change, you'll learn something from this show. Because that tradition that started with the Panthers, it continues in Oakland till this day. If a group of young people can feed other members of the black community, why can't the state? When the community here in Oakland chanted, I am Oscar Grant, it created a movement throughout this nation. Because the power really is in the people. If we can organize the people and rally the people around this cause, then we've already won. And D, you know, you, me, and our comrades, I like to think we're continuing that tradition too. We're continuing this fight for revolutionary change. Plus, we're going to be talking to musicians, athletes, organizers, and activists, all these people who make the culture here so special. So this show is not only a historical documentation of the town, but it's a love letter to Oakland and a dedication to the Africans and indigenous people who make it what it is. So this is Tales of the Town, a podcast about Black Oakland. Over the next 12 episodes, we're going to tell you the story of Black Oakland. But Oakland, it didn't start with hell of Black people. In 1940, Oakland was just 3% Black. 3%. The Black community here, it was hella tiny. But in just a few decades, Oakland went from being 3% Black to being a hub for Black culture and Black liberation. And by the 80s, Black folks would make up just about half of Oakland's population. So y'all is probably wondering, how did this all happen? And we're going to tell you how it happened. Almost all those new black folks came from the South in what was known as the Second Great Migration. The First Great Migration was earlier, and that had black folks heading north to cities like New York, 
Chicago, and Cleveland. What made the second Great Migration different is people weren't just moving north anymore. During the 40s, 50s, and 60s, hundreds of thousands of Black Southerners moved west. And this is the historical event that created Black Oakland. So, to understand the town, you have to understand that a lot of older Black Oaklanders, they started their lives as Black Southerners, including... <laughs> how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. My Auntie Anita. I'm talking to you. <laughs> I know, I get to talk to you a lot recently. I know. You need to talk to me more. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. My Auntie Anita was in her late 80s, and she transitioned to an ancestor not long after recording this episode. Even though I call her Auntie Anita, she's actually my great aunt, my granny sister. Back in the 30s, she and her family, they all lived in rural Louisiana. It was during Jim Crow, which meant segregation was legal and violence from groups like the KKK was rampant. Black people worked and paid their taxes, and in return, they got second-class schools, no voting rights, and a whole bunch of other oppression. Anita and her family lived in an all-black town, and she went to an all-black school where she studied from used, beat-up old textbooks that a white school didn't want anymore. For fun, she and her friends, they would all go to the movies. But we had to go. We had to go up, up in the balcony to, to go to the movies. You know, they had a division between whites and blacks. That movie theater was in a white town nearby. And as it turns out, it actually wasn't that nearby. It was. We used to walk it sometimes. Maybe... 10 miles. Um, That's wild. That's, I, I just looked it up. It's like two miles. It's a, about a two-hour walk. Mm, 10 miles wasn't bad for kids. That, that um... That's why you're so quick on your feet still, huh? <laughs> so, how did Anita get from rural Louisiana to Oakland? Well, Anita's dad, my great-great-grandfather, he was college educated. And he learned cutting-edge farming techniques in school. Stuff like how you have to plant soybeans every so often to put nitrogen back into the soil. His expertise helped find him a good working job for the state of Louisiana. It was solid, middle-class work. As my auntie Anita remembers it, they paid her dad to drive around and to share his knowledge with rural farmers who were both black and white. The black farmers, they listened to him. You know, they did what he told them to do. And the black farmers' crops came out so well. But these white farmers, they didn't take his advice. And that led to trouble for Anita's dad. Anita's son, Freddie, who was my uncle Freddie, picks up the story from here. A couple of seasons into it, they, uh, their crops weren't as robust. And they blamed it on him. And they threatened him. And they, they, my grandfather didn't go into specifics, but they said they, they did something in it on his house. I don't know if it was graffiti or it was a cross or something like that, but they did something at the house and he knew it was time to go. Uncle Freddie says his grandpa never told him if it was the KKK, but he thinks that it was. Obviously, that sort of white supremacist terrorism, it was common in places like Louisiana at that time. And it's a big reason why so many black people fled the South, including Anita's dad. Anita's dad feared for his life, so he convinced a friend with the car to drive him all the way to California. Once he got to Oakland, he stayed with a relative and made plans to send for his wife and his kids. It was too risky for him to return to Louisiana by himself, so he sent his friend to pack up the rest of the family. And that's how on one day in 1939, Anita and her six siblings got all their things together, crammed into an old Ford, and said goodbye to their hometown. What do you remember about that day? I, I wrote on or I wrote on the house. I wrote big letters. Going to California and not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and and my little my girl my little friends, we were in the car leaving and they were just running behind the car and crying. It was sad. It was really sad. <laughs> Sometimes my friend and I be talking, and she'll say something to me, and that'll make me go back in my mind. Ooh, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my great granny, Charlene. Right 
Around the same time that your Aunt Anita and her family were driving to Oakland, my great-grandma and her family were leaving the South, too. You too young to bring up some of that stuff that Barbara and I have talked about. You too young. Because <laughs> we both 91 years old. <laughs> but hasn't much changed being youngsters, really. So like she said, my great-grandma's in her 90s now. But back in 1941, she was just 12 years old and living in Port Arthur, Texas. Port Arthur is a small city on the Texas-Louisiana border down in the Gulf of Mexico. When Charlene lived there, it was an industrial town with giant oil refineries and a busy port. Charlene liked living in Port Arthur, but the rest of her extended family, her mom's six siblings and all of their kids, they had already moved west to California. For years, Charlene's aunts and uncles pressured her mom to join the family out west. Finally, in 1941, Charlene's mom, my great-great-grandmother Jewel, caved in. And so, 12-year-old Charlene, Jewel, and the rest of the family got their things together and hopped on a train to Oakland. Let me tell you about that train. Oh, this is what's amazing. We was all on that train. There was not nobody on that train but just black people. She was sitting in a segregated train car heading west toward California. Then the train stopped and all these other people started getting on the train. White people. And I couldn't figure out what the hell is going on. We all was in here, just not with black people. And all of a sudden, you're just getting mixed with everybody. They got it conglomerated, black, white, and all of us together. That's when I found out about what they call the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> <laughs> My great-grandma Charlene and her family were officially out of the South. Soon, they'd be in Oakland. And they would meet all these other black Southerners who had also moved thousands of miles to find a new home. Every year, they would see more and more black folks fleeing the Jim Crow South, arriving in the town. And in the years to come, these black families would transform Oakland. They'd also face a lot of new forms of injustice. And how black Oaklanders responded to this injustice will make history. Oh, uh, when we came into California, oh, it was so beautiful. I mean, it it was just so, it was like going to heaven. And it was cool. It was cool in the evening, and it was just nice. I thought it was so, so good. That's my Auntie Anita again. She was one of about 150,000 Black people who came to Oakland during the Second Great Migration. Over three decades, waves of Black Southerners will move to Oakland like Charlene and Anita. Our families, they was a part of the first wave. And unlike a lot of folks that came later, that first wave was mostly middle-class families. We learned about this by talking to Donna Murch. She's a historian who has written about how the first and second great migrations shaped Oakland. A general rule of migration is that the people with the most resources leave first. So it makes sense. The people that have saved money, you know, moving across the country or across the world is expensive. So people tend to be more affluent who go first. Many in this first wave were skilled workers, and those skilled workers had just entered a new job market. The U.S. was just entering World War II, which meant a lot of the Bay Area's current labor force was being shipped off to Europe and Japan. For these new arrivals from the South, this meant jobs. And these wartime jobs were amazing during World War II. This is the, one of the biggest periods of African-American economic development. Robert Weaver, who was a Black policy intellectual in the 1930s, compares the increase in opportunity to World War II, saying it's the greatest Black increase in opportunity next to emancipation. So that gives you the scale. Some of the best wartime jobs were found at the Port of Oakland. Today, the port is one of the busiest in the United States. All day, every day, containers come on and off ships. But during World War II, there was really only one thing happening down there. That's where ships were being built, like battleships and cargo ships. Charlene's husband, My great-grandfather, Clarence Sr., got one of these jobs. Later, their son, Clarence Jr., who was my uncle Clarence, will also work at the port as a longshoreman, loading and unloading ships. Here's my uncle Clarence talking about what an opportunity like the jobs at the port meant for his father. There were very few opportunities for Black people to work, uh, even those who had education. And uh, so those jobs became some of the most important jobs for Blacks. And so I know that from my own father's perspective, he uh, really uh, uh, 
was looking forward to one day becoming a longshore worker because he he knew that the longshore job provided the opportunity for disposable income. That income allowed the family to buy a house in North Oakland, where generations of my family had been born and raised. My great-grandfather held on to his job at the port after World War II ended, but a lot of black workers weren't so lucky. With the war over, those jobs building ships disappeared, and white soldiers returning home needed to find work, which made the job market a lot more saturated due to segregation. On top of that, black families continued migrating to Oakland from the South. Charlene remembers year after year how people kept showing up. The people used to go down to the train station to see who was coming in on them trains. They didn't have no suitcases, they had boxes. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> It was like it was run, coming running from somewhere to freedom. <laughs> they were coming from somewhere to freedom. We'll get to how free California actually was for these Black Southerners. But for now, we want to talk about where these folks were coming from and why. Like we've said, to understand Oakland, you have to understand the Great Migration. And we feel like there's something that gets missed when people use that word, migration. Which brings us to a segment on the show we call, Let Me Put You On Something. Put me on some. Put me on some. Yes, sir. Let Me Put You On Some is where we go deep on one important lesson from the story that we is telling. So today, let me put you on to this. All these black people who fled the South during the Great Migration, that wasn't migrants. They was refugees. And something I find funny, really both funny and frustrating, is that sometimes people talk about the Great Migration as if it was just some enchanting excursion. You know, they talk about it as if all these Black folks who were heading north or west were just jumping on the Harry Potter train to Hogwarts or riding the Soul Train. And that's really not what it was at all. You know, we got to think about the violence that these folks were fleeing. And I think it's important that we touch on that, right? because what they were fleeing was the Jim Crow South. They were fleeing white supremacist terrorism. And so, yeah, there's this joy and this sense of opportunity and new beginnings that Anita and Charlene might've felt as kids, but the driving force for so many of our ancestors and elders was looking for safety. Thousand percent. You know, when you hear the word migration, you often think about birds migrating, you feel me? Or whales migrating up the Pacific coast to go mate, right? And that was completely different from the situation that black folks in Jim Crow South was facing. When we talk about migrating, there's this element of choice and free will that's often associated with the word. So if we're not careful, we can reference a context that didn't actually exist for many of the black folks that were leaving the South. For many of them, it was a matter of life or death. For others, they were so desperate for a glimmer of hope that they left behind all they knew and had. Does that sound like choice and free will? And these words matter, bruh, because it's like, Look how some people literally say that all black people are immigrants, bruh. Like, literally, they'll use the words, all black people came from Africa as immigrants. And this is purely just white supremacist propaganda. And that's why the word and calling it refugee is so important. Because then we're actually talking about the full history of what has happened and not erasing the white supremacist violence that people have faced. I mean, even as we use the word refugee, when you think about refuge... It's like finally arriving at your place of solace. Black folks in America have not reached that destination. We haven't found refuge. We're in constant search of it, of a place to feel safe on stolen land as stolen people. And now, if we look at black people here in Oakland, it's still a refugee-like situation when we're experiencing the vast amount of gentrification that we was experiencing. We go to these houseless camps, right? These houseless camps remind me of shanty towns in South Africa. There's no doubt that Oakland is a beautiful place. There's no doubt that the Bay Area is a beautiful place. But when you look at the living conditions that black people have been subjected to, it's very clear that the white supremacist violence and the Jim Crow South also found its way here to Oakland. Before we go any further, we got something dope we want to share with y'all. In addition to the Tales of the Town podcast, we put together an album featuring artists from all over the Bay Area. Artists such as Rex Life Raj, g Easy, Pilo, Jane Hancock, La Russell, Guap Dad 4000, and more 
have come together to produce 11 original songs for the Tales of the Town album, releasing October 14th. All proceeds from the music go towards supporting People's Programs, a grassroots organization here in Oakland. Here's a sneak peek at the first single off the album, Fuck 12 Freestyle by La Russell and Guap Dad 4000, releasing this Friday. Fuck a cop, fuck a pig, fuck a Fuck Donald Trump, CNN, and Fox Bitch, I'm paid in full, I should pull up in a drop Fuck the DEA, FBI, and SWAT Never get complacent The house ain't a home when it's vacant Tryna fry a pig, I smell bacon How they build the hood in a power plant adjacent Never thought we'd make it in the house from the basement Even when I'm lost, I never lost it They wanna say yes, boss, we ended up the boss A lot of bell, BBL, and baby food Now Let's get back to the story. Like my granny Charlene was saying. This is like it was run, coming running from somewhere f- to freedom. <laughs> All these black people were showing up in Oakland thinking they found freedom. And I guess in some ways they had. They were quote unquote free from Jim Crow. But as the years went by, it became clear, especially to these refugees' children, that for all that they had escaped in the South, they would still find white supremacy and racial segregation in Oakland. Let's bring back historian Donna Murch. As the Black population grows rapidly, you see a codification of segregation. It's not a legal Jim Crow segregation, it's in practice. So Black children being concentrated into particular high schools and, you know, junior high schools and grade schools. At the same time the schools were becoming segregated, so were Oakland's neighborhoods. Charlene remembers white flight starting just a few years after her family moved to North Oakland. She could see it happening right through her front windows. Cross 54th Street over there, but nobody over there. Cross 54th Street over there by the, this look, what I call it, that hot dog hamburger stand. But nothing over there but white folks. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, that changed. I mean, you, you you can watch it and see it change, you know. It changed fast right in my face with me sitting here. <laughs> yeah. Like white folks being here, next thing you know, they was gone. <laughs> and the unjust police and the black people that had been a hallmark of the Jim Crow South it found a new life in Oakland schools through harsh disciplinary codes. Disciplinary codes in which Black children are treated different than white children, saying that Black children, it wasn't safe for them to meet in assemblies because they could develop the fever and become unruly. You have expulsions. You have physical discipline, incredible, brutal authoritarian practices. These racist disciplinary codes pushed a lot of Black children and teens into what we now call the school-to-prison pipeline. Many were confined in juvenile prisons, including Huey Newton, who would one day go on to co-found the Black Panther Party. Being mistreated in school, being locked up as 13- or 14-year-old kids, these are the types of things that radicalize people. And that radicalization will combine with unrest that was growing across the country to create a new movement for Black liberation that was rooted in Oakland. Firemen were harassed by snipers and brick-throwing hoodlums as they attempted to control the fires, many of which were left to burn It was the mid-60s. Things were shifting. The images on TV and in newspapers were no longer just of sit-ins at lunch counters and nonviolent resistance in the South. Instead, cities in the North and West were burning. alone were put at $200 million. Anger from decades, really centuries, of injustice spilled into the streets. Windows were smashed, cars were overturned, buildings were damaged. Thousands of people were arrested or beaten by police in cities across the country. From Harlem to Newark to Detroit to Chicago, and in 1965, to Watts. Six days of rioting in a Negro section of Los Angeles left behind scenes reminiscent of war-torn cities. Just 400 miles north, a group of young organizers was watching Watts burn. They watched all this raw anger rage in the streets. Black people in Watts, black people across the country, they was clearly fed up. And these young organizers, they believed that they could channel this rage into revolution. This new group, it was more radical than Dr. King. And the people that they looked up to was Malcolm X, Kwame Nkrumah, Marx, Lenin, and Mao. These organizers were going to take those revolutionary ideas and build something new. It was the start of a new era in the struggle for black liberation. And it was all going down in Oakland. Chairman of the Black Panther Party, Bobby Seale. Bring him on. Of all the things that you've heard in the press, 
for all the derogatory statements that's been made in the press about Brother Huey P. Newton to guide you away from seeing this basic platform that Huey was talking about for his own people. I say, me hate a white person? I say, wait a minute, man, let's back up a little bit. We hate the oppression that we live in. We hate cops beating black people over their heads and murdering them. That's what we hate. We're being killed through the lack of medical care, the lack of funds because of unemployment. So violence can take many forms. Police officers told me to stop moving around. You're making me nervous. I told him he didn't have any reason to be nervous because he had a gun and I didn't. He said, well, it might go off. I might have to shoot you. So I told him to go ahead and shoot. Every black man in this house should be against the war in Vietnam. He's got to be against the war in Vietnam because they're killing our black brothers over there. I don't believe this country will be able to fight every country in the world and also fight a revolutionary war at home. That's what we're really banking on. All right, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you. My uncle Clarence, who we heard from earlier, he joined the Black Panther Party at a pretty young age. And one thing that's easy to miss with the Panthers, with all the guns and berets and captivating speeches that they're known for, is that a lot of the work they did wasn't always glamorous. It was the day-to-day behind-the-scenes stuff, the administrative work that kept the programs running. And it could be hard for a group of young Black revolutionaries to find a place to meet. So when Uncle Clarence joined and the group needed different places to gather, Clarence offered at my great-grandma Charlene's house. I asked her about this. What was it like to have them having meetings in your house? Yeah, it would be quite a few of them. Yeah, they'd come in, they'd be in that back room. Bunch of young folks? Yeah, Mm mm-hmm, yeah. They would be very peaceful and polite and do what they had to do, talk, have their meeting. And they finish, they get up and they go. I thought, well, they ain't doing nothing bad. They ain't doing no worse than these pickle rules out here, so... Like I said, they had some good people, some good, some of them, you know. Just think about it for a second. 25 years earlier, Charlene, Anita, and so many other black folks had fled the Jim Crow South. Then, after escaping that racism, there was a system of white supremacy in Oakland continuing to develop around them. Segregated schools, redlining, racist policing and disciplinary codes. This in many ways mirrored the racial segregation of the Jim Crow South. These refugees' children saw this oppression up close. And so, here was my great granny Charlene, 2,000 miles away from her hometown, sitting in the next room as young people planned for revolution. It's fitting that the Panthers would sometimes meet in my great grandma's house, because even though the party started in Oakland, its roots are Charlene's roots. Its roots are the South, the rural South. This came up in our conversation with Donna Murch. She's the historian we heard from earlier. This thing that gets called armed self-defense in 1966, historians always thought of this as being a uniquely northern urban form. Civil disobedience was practiced in the South, and then black power was really a creature of northern and western cities. But if you go back and you look at the histories, the people that found the party, both the leadership and the rank and file in the Bay Area and then in other parts of the country, were Southern migrants, and many of them understood themselves as Southern. The two men who founded the party, Huey Noon and Bobby Seal, they were both born in the rural South. After Bobby's family moved to Oakland, they still take trips back home to small town Texas. And on those trips, Bobby's cousins, they would take them hunting. And that's how we learn how to handle a gun, and that's how we learn how to aim and fire. Not in Oakland, but in rural Texas. Fast forward to the 60s. When Huey and Bobby decided to start something, one of their main inspirations was a radical group in rural Alabama called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. It was co-founded in the mid-60s by a Pan-African revolutionary who began organizing during the Civil Rights Movement by the name of Kwame Ture, who at the time was known as Stokely Carmichael. We wanted to say that this is a student conference, as it should be, held on a campus, and that We're not ever to be caught up in the intellectual masturbation of the question of black power. The Lowndes County Freedom Organization helped black people register to vote, but that wasn't all. They were also armed, and they made a point of open carrying their weapons, sending a message to white races across the country. Huey and Bobby also noticed the group's logo, 
and decided to make it their own. That logo was a Black Panther. Over the next couple of episodes, we're going to go deeper into the Black Panther Party and the impact it had. For now, though, you got to understand one thing. There is no Black Panther Party without the Great Migration. And there's no Black Oakland without the Great Migration. Everything we're going to talk about on this show, from the Panthers to struggles today over gentrification and policing and COVID, to all the beauty that's come out the town, the music, the sports fans, you can trace it all back to Anita and Charlene and all these other families who left everything they knew to come here. The fact that I can get on the phone with my grandma for an hour, my great grandma, and have a phone call about some stuff that happened 70, 75 years ago, that's that's wild. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Well, baby, I've seen a lot of changes. And I keep hoping that they change and get look like to me. They'll come up and be better for better and get better. You know? We are resilient people, are proud people, like you said. Oh, God. That's the thing that they hate about us. All that you do to them, you still prosper. They keep moving. This season on Tales of the Town. We're fighting for each other. We're fighting for all of us. Surveillance, wiretapping, those kind of things actually did happen. The murder of Oscar Grant was that moment when people even outside of our community were like, nah, like we saw what happened and we got the video to prove it. Fear of black and brown students is so embedded in our curriculum in schools that it drives administrators and adults to call police on children. Even if you have a, a lease, they're going to find a way to get you out of there. And then I had to figure out, well, where am I going to stay? Where am I going to sleep at? Because I slept in my car for eight months. The only thing you should be doing in the community is asking the community what they want, what they need. So just understand that a lot of the things you listen to are heavily influenced by Bay Rap. And I can sit and trace it and say, this is just this. And then when I do it, people be like, damn. Then when I show them the year, they be like, damn. Oakland is, it's the duality. Seeing the beauty through the messiness. Tales of the Town is hosted and executive produced by me, Abbas Muntakim, and Dawensi Parham. Our senior producer is Maya Cueva. Fact checking is done by Danya Suleiman and Bashira Mack. Mixing and sound design is done by Pat Masidi Miller and Lauren Newsom. The theme song was produced by Cheyenne G and Carrie Lynn. The music from the Tales of the Town album that we featured on this episode is from La Russell and Guapdad 4000. Special thanks to Donna Merch at Rutgers. Be sure to check out her book, Living for the City, Migration, Education, and the Rise of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. Thanks to my Uncle Freddie, and of course my Auntie Anita. D, anyone you want to thank? Yeah, thank you to my Granny Merlin, my Uncle Clarence, aka Uncle Buzz, and of course to my great-grandmother Charlene. If you like what you heard on this episode, please be sure to subscribe to wherever you get your podcast at. Give us a five-star review, and tell all your people about it. So this, okay, this, <laughs> it's t- this is tales of like this literally four T's in a row, bro. It's like, all right. Let me just try. Let me try. Okay.